15 or 20 minutes on this talk uh, is looking at treating patellofemoral pain with foot orthoses. And as always, we try and take a very evidence-based based approach to, uh, to our orthotic therapy. Um, so this is what we'll look at today, uh, well, a few goals here. First, we're just going to briefly review the path of mechanics at knee pain, of knee pain, particularly as it might be affected by foot function. Uh, primarily today, since we're looking at patellofemoral dysfunction, we're going to look at transverse plane problems. Uh, but I will, I will briefly mention frontal plane mechanics. Um, the so specific pathology we'll look at today will be patellofemoral pain syndrome. You see I've also mentioned osteoarthritis of the medial compartment of the knee. Uh, and that's actually what we'll be hitting next month's, uh, next month's webinar. And then finally, we'll end up looking at how to write a specific orthotic prescription for patellofemoral pain syndrome. So again, we're going to look uh, briefly at the pathomechanics of the knee um, and uh, particularly in the transverse and frontal planes. All right, so let your slide catch up here. Um, there's actually a lot of research looking at the effect of foot function on knee mechanics in the transverse plane. A manter way back in 41 uh, noted that sapelar joint pronation and, and collapse of the mid-tarsal joint would help determine the extent of internal tibia rotation. Uh, NIG back in 93 noted that the amount and velocity of excessive, excessive foot pronation increases the amount and force of internal tibia rotation. Um, a couple studies in the 90s uh, noted that sapelar joint pronation would exaggerate the dislocation moment of the knee in the transverse plane. And essentially what we're seeing here is, is as that mid-tarsal joint collapses and then the, mid, the uh, subtalar joint pronates, we see that internal rotation at the leg and of the leg and then that puts a torque on the knee. Now, very briefly, we're going to just look at uh, frontal plane mechanics. We'll go over this in much more detail next month when we look at osteoarthritis of the knee. But most of the studies that we found uh, looking at frontal plane mechanics as it related to the foot actually had to do with types with different wedging of the foot, both varus and valgus wedging. Um, and what the studies noted was that a varus wedge on the foot tended to increase torque through the medial knee. It would close down the medial knee while it would open the lateral knee. And while valgus wedging would do exactly the opposite. Put a valgus wedge under the heel of the foot and you uh, close the lateral knee down and then you see an opening of, of the medial knee. So I, I wanted to mention that today because every orthosis acts as a wedge of some sort. So we, regardless of whether you're trying to just control the, the uh, the transverse plane motion, you may very well be affecting uh, frontal plane motion too. So if you have a patient that has patellofemoral dysfunction, in addition they have, uh, say, osteoarthritis of the medial compartment of the knee, you want to be aware of this because you may end up increasing or decreasing symptoms of their knee arthritis as you're trying to treat their patellofemoral problems. All right, so let's actually go forward into uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, Defined essentially as retropatellar or peripatellar pain um, due to physical and biomechanical changes or biochemical changes in the patellofemoral joint. Um, there's actually not, it, it's um, not real clear exactly what it is, but it essentially seems to be an overload problem of the patella against the femur. Uh, most, it's the most common knee complaint in athletes and actually even in non-athletes, uh, commonly called runner's knee. Uh, typically, it tends to present um, with activity and is uh, given by the name runner's knee. It's very common with runners. Uh, often, uh, the pain is worse when uh, patients are going downstairs or going down hills. Um, and even prolonged sitting, which, which pulls the patella right into the femur very hard, uh, can trigger the pain. That's often, uh, you've probably heard of the theater sign. After sitting for a couple hours, you stand up and that, that knee just feels stiff. So to look at the pathomechanics now of patellofemoral pain syndrome as it um, leads to the pain is a um, couple studies here. Nargozensi, I think is how to pronounce that, back in 95, noted that transverse plane motion of the leg and excessive foot pronation would contribute to malalignment of the patella on the femur. Um, and so once again, you see that internal leg rotation, and that would lead then to uh, chondral degrada degradation, it would lead to erosion of the cartilage, can lead to pain and inflammation in the knee. Uh, Tiberio in 87 noted that excessive uh, pronation and subsequent internal rotation of the tibia would delay external tibial rotation and that creates a damaging torque on the knee. 
So from there, we start looking at some of the studies that actually relate the use of foot orthoses to treating patellofemoral dysfunction. And there are a number of them out there. Um, a few, we've got four here today uh, that we're going to look at. Um, Ng in 93 uh, did a study using soft foot orthoses with stretching. And he had, he had his subjects in the control group. He had them only stretch. Uh, in the test group, he used the orthoses and the stretching, and he found that he had a significant reduction in pain uh, for patients while running and walking stairs uh, compared to the control group. So those using the orthoses had significant reduction of the patellofemoral pain. Um, Johnson in 2001 used a custom semi-rigid orthosis, and he evaluated them uh, for the patellofemoral pain using something called the Womax score. Uh, basically, what he did is rate um, stiffness, pain, and physical function. He found that stiffness and pain decreased, and physical function tended to improve after only using the devices for a couple weeks. Um, and then Pittman in 2000 used a um, basically a podiatric standard podiatric type orthosis, a balanced custom functional orthosis and found that nearly 70% of patients had improvement in pain. Um, Emil Saxino practices uh, down in the uh, South Bay. Um, he did a study in 2003 and evaluated the effectiveness of custom semi-rigid root type orthotics uh, on about 100 patients, about half male, half female. Um, he did a device uh, that had base, it, it's a standard polypropylene type orthosis, had a rear foot post, so of, of a two-degree Barris post, which is very similar to a two-degree or a two-millimeter medial heel sky. Um, he basically just had these patients start wearing, um, wearing these orthotic devices and has found that over 75% of his patients showed a significant decrease uh, in their patellofemoral related knee pain while wearing the orthosis. So now let's take a look at what exactly what we might do with the prescription um, in order to get the best outcome. When, so you're ready to write that prescription for that patient with patellofemoral dysfunction. What, what's your goal here? First goal seems to be based on the research is we want to limit internal leg rotation. And so as we go through looking at each of these prescription items, that's really what we want to try and think about. And one of the first things I, I like to think about in this situation is how closely should that orthosis conform to the arch of the foot? And you can see this picture over here that that device, here I've got the foot in neutral and I've plantar flexed the first ray, so I've accentuated the arch basically to the maximum and I still have an orthosis that conforms very, very closely to the arch of the foot. Um, so what, what's that mean for, for us in this situation? Well, what that's going to do is by conforming closely to the arch, that's going to reduce collapse of the mid-tarsal joint. By reducing collapse of the metatarsal joint, we're going to limit subtalar joint pronation and by limiting subtalar joint pronation, we're going to reduce tibial uh, rotation, internal tibial rotation, and that's going to reduce those pathologic stresses on the knee that lead to patellofemoral dysfunction. So the first thing we're going to look at is getting a device that conforms quite closely to the arch of the foot. Now, in order to do that, you want to do a couple things, and this is dependent on both you and it's very dependent on what your laboratory does also. So on your side, as a physician, you need to prescribe a minimum fill. Right? Uh, that means that we're that you're asking your lab to put a very small amount of arch fill into the medial arch here. This uh, cast here closest to you has quite a bit of fill. This one back here farthest from you has very small amount of fill. Small amount of fill means that device should conform very closely to the arch of the foot. Now, obviously here we see some plaster casts. Most of this is done on CAD CAM computer now, but the, the concepts are exactly the same. We're still choosing how much fill to put in there. So the second part of this is to ensure that your lab is doing this correctly, that they truly are doing a uh, minimum fill when you ask for it. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually a problem throughout the industry that, the, uh, that we see labs putting too much fill into the medial arch. And the reason is this makes for a very comfortable, nev never, a orthosis is never going to irritate the arch, never has potential to irritate the arch because it comes nowhere near the arch. Unfortunately, it also does not do a very good job at controlling the foot. So again, you want to um, you want to ensure your lab is at, if you're prescribing a minimum fill, you want to ensure your lab is following through on that. Easiest way to do that is to when that patient gets back to the office, put them in neutral, plantar flex that first ray, hold the orthosis up to the arch of the foot, and conform and confirm that it is conforming very closely to that arch. If that's the case, you know your lab is doing what you've asked them to do. 
Uh, the next thing you might want to think about is inverting the positive cast a few degrees. And if you look at this positive here, it is thicker under the first than it is under the fifth. That shows that we've inverted this positive. Uh, by doing that, we've let that first drop down to the ground farther, and we've essentially raised the arch. Right? So this is another way to hug that arch even a little tighter to better stop collapse of the metarsal joint which once again, we'll go through this, decreases subtalar joint pronation, decreases internal leg rotation, and decreases that, those stresses on the knee that lead to patellofemoral dysfunction. So this is another option you can do to try and get him a little bit better control over the mid-tarsal joint. Next thing to think about is your heel cup depth. So you're going to see that mid-tarsal joint collapse. Uh, in some patients, they're just going to have a direct sagittal plane, plane collapse of the arch. Other patients, you'll see that their heel will evert, leading to collapse of the arch. So um, if this is the situation, you want to do something to help stop that heel from everting. Well, one of the easiest things you can do is use a deeper heel cup. If we look at these two pictures here, here's a device on the left that has a shallow heel cup. Over here, we, we see a, a deeper heel cup. That deeper heel cup has, is able to place more force on this portion of the calcaneus, medial to the axis of the, to, of the subtalar joint. By doing that, you're going to use that ortho, your, that orthosis is going to do a much better job at applying a supinatory torque to the foot because it's putting more force farther medial to the subtalar joint. You have a longer lever arm, again, again a greater supinatory torque that helps decrease subtalar joint pronation, once again decreasing internal tibial rotation, and decreasing the forces that lead to uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Another way that you can try and decrease that, um, uh, decrease subtalar joint pronation directly by increasing supinatory torque upon the heel is to use a medial heel skive. Here we see a, de a demonstration of uh, representation of uh, up here would be the tibia and the talus. Down here is the calcaneus. Um, this dot here represents the subtalar joint axis. And put, by putting a varus wedge under the heel, you shift that center of force further medial to the subtalar joint axis, and you increase that supinatory torque, and again, decrease subtalar joint pronation, decrease internal tibial rotation, and decrease stress on the knee. Now, one key to think about, if you are prescribing a lot of medial heel skies, or you're prescribing a medial heel sky for this particular patient, is you do need a deeper heel cup if you're going to prescribe a medial sky. Using a shallow heel cup uh, on a medial sky doesn't really do, do your patient any good. You're not going to have enough surface area to apply force. So if you are going to use a medial sky, you want to make sure you're using a fairly deep heel cup. For example, a 4 millimeter sky is going to require at least a 14 millimeter heel cup, um, and an 18 millimeter sky, or a 6 millimeter sky is going to require at least an 18 millimeter heel cup. Now, a good lab will let you know this. So this is, this is critical. And we, for example, if a patient or a client sends us a, uh, a prescription requesting a 6 millimeter sky and a shallow heel cup, we're going to call that doctor and tell them this just isn't really worth it. All you're going to do is narrow the heel cup without any clinical benefit. Um, the other thing that keep in mind is that for um, comfort's sake, sometimes when you do a high medial sky, the foot can slide slightly to the lateral aspect. So we, our recommendation is you always add a little bit of extra cast fill to get a little bit extra width on that heel cup whenever you're prescribing that medial heel skive. All right, so now we come to kind of, um, let's look at what our prescription would be based on, on our findings so far. Um, here's our recommendation on a prescri orthotic prescription for patellofemoral dysfunction. Um, our negative cast, you want to take a neutral suspension cast, non-weight bearing, and you want to plantar flex the first ray. And if you're not familiar with that technique, we have um, descriptions and video on our website. Um, the material should be semi-rigid. I personally like polypropylene because it's very, very easy to work with. And in this situation, we do want a device that hugs the arch very closely. Uh, and just in case that patient has a situation where it feels a little bit too high, poly is extremely easy to adjust to bring it down a little bit, um, where a, a, a graphite material tends to be a little bit more difficult to adjust, for example. Our positive cast correction, we're going to balance the positive perpendicular, or we may consider inverting it a few degrees. 
Uh, the heel cup and medial skive, really they're dependent on the resting calcaneal stance position. If the heel's everted, you want a deep heel cup and use of a medial skive. If the heel is rectus or inverted, those are not, near, those are not very important. Uh, I usually use a wide width just for additional metarsal joint control. Uh, cast fill, almost always we use minimum in this situation uh, to help prevent metarsal joint collapse. A rear foot post uh, to stabilize the device in the shoe so it doesn't rock in the frontal plane. And then clinically for this situation, uh, this uh, for patellofemoral pain syndrome, you don't really need a top cover and there's no real need for any forefoot extension. So, of course, there's no problem with adding a top cover if you want it for cushion, but clinically it's really not necessary. Uh, if you'd rather use a prefabricated orthosis, I, you should be looking for one that provides these same types of modifications. Um, I personally like the, um, our, uh, uh, the ProLab P3 posted device that uh, has a three degree valgus and is balanced perpendicular, three, foot, three degree four foot valgus balanced perpendicular, has a fairly deep heel cup uh, so we can help stop uh, heel eversion. We do incorporate a, a two degree medial heel skive, has a rear foot post to prevent it from rocking in the shoe. And then the cast fill is based on an average amount of what would be an, a minimum fill for the average arch that we've scanned over the past 10 or 15 years. So compared to most prefabs, it's going to be a higher arch and it's going to better conform to the arch of the foot. Summary here, um, we really have a significant number of studies that do demonstrate a good outcome for orthotic devices for patellofemoral pain syndrome. And, but if you look at the studies, there's actually a lot of variation in the devices themselves. So we, we've tried to take um, the, the studies on the path of mechanics that come up with what we think is probably the best prescription for this problem, and this is certainly currently our recommendation. Um, other studies on specific orthotic devices may come out in the future, and if that happens, we will let our clients know. Um, but right now, our goal is certainly to try and decrease internal tibial rotation, and we think this is probably the best prescription to do it.